This lesson, 9.1, is an introduction to simple probability. Most of the ideas in this lesson will be familiar to you since you've already had lessons in previous years about probability. The first thing to talk about is that there are two types of probability. One is theoretical, and that's the kind that you are familiar with, with you predicting something's going to happen. That's all based on theoretical probability. And then experimental probability. Experimental probability is based on something or an experiment that's already happened, and so then you're going to base the future based on that. So theoretical probability, you take the number of desired outcomes over the total possible outcomes. So if you're going to toss a coin, there is one possible outcome that you want, so you want either heads or tails, but there are two outcomes that it could be. For experimental probability, you look at the number of event occurrences. So let's say you toss a coin five times and you get seven heads and three tails. Then the experimental probability of getting heads next time is seven out of ten instead of the theoretical probability of one half. So experimental probability is it's going to change depending on what your outcomes were on your experiment. So in order to um, do most of our problems will be doing theoretical probability, but there will be a few questions about experimental probability. Okay, the next one is compound events, and we'll be talking a lot about compound events in this unit. And compound events is a combination of two or more simple events. So like if you toss a coin and then you toss a coin, or you toss a coin and then you roll a die, or you roll a die and then you spin a spinner. So what's the probability that you get like a heads and a six? And that would be compound events. To find the probability of compound events, the formula is the probability of A and B. So the probability of the two things happening is the probability of A times the probability of B. This is only for independent events. We will talk about dependent events a little bit later, and there will be a different formula for dependent events. And that's something like if you take a gumball out of the gumball machine and eat it, what's the probability that you get the same color gumball the next time? And so that would be something that's dependent. A sample space is if you were to write down all the possibilities that could happen, then that would be a sample space. So if I'm tossing a coin, my sample space is heads and tails. If I'm tossing two coins, then I could get heads and then heads, heads and then tails, tails and then heads, or tails and then tails. That's the sample space. So depending on how many things you're doing and how many outcome each event has, the sample space can be quite large. Okay, the first one we're going to talk about is actually experimental probability. And the reason that it's experimental is because we're looking at the results of doing something. So the result of rolling a number cube or dice five or 54 times. So I sat down and rolled the dice 54 times and here's what I got. And I sorted all my answers in order so it's a little bit easier to um, use. But we're gonna use these results to find the experimental probability. So if I was not doing experimental, if I was doing theoretical probability and I said, what's the probability of getting a three? It'll be one sixth. Probability of getting a four, one sixth. Probability of not getting a five, that would be a one, two, three, four, or six, that would be five out of six. Probability of seven would never happen, impossible, zero. So that's what it would be theoretically, but it, based on my experiment, I have to look at that differently. So what's the probability of getting a three? So come over to my experiment results and look at the threes. How many did I get? If you count them up, there's 13 threes out of 54 rolls that I did. And so that's my experimental probability. So the next time I roll on the 55th time, I have a 13 out of 54 chance of getting a three. Now with probability, there's a couple of ways that we will write this. And so it just depends on what the directions say and the type of question you're being asked. So 13 out of 54 is a reduced fraction. Another way that I can write that is to get my calculator and do 13 divided by 54. And I would write it as a decimal. Now the tricky thing about decimals is that you have to figure out where to round it to. 
And so your directions, it says write the decimal around to the nearest tenth. So 0 0.2407, that's going to be approximately 0 0.2. Okay, so that would be my answer rounded to the nearest tenth. That's approximate. So 13 over 54, that's exact. Now one other thing, remember that if you're going to write percents, which we often do in probability, that when you have a decimal like 0 0.2, that changes to 20%. Remove your decimal twice. So if I would have rounded that to the nearest hundredth, then that would have been 24%. So that's quite a bit different, and that's why you've got to be careful about rounding. So just go with what the directions say. If the directions don't say anything, it's better to be more accurate than less accurate. Okay, the probability of getting a 4. So we're going to look at our 4s, and how many 4s do I have? I've got 5 of them out of 54. So my chances are much less of getting a 4 than they were of getting a 3, which theoretically, that doesn't make sense. Theoretically, I have the same chance, but because of this experiment, I have a different probability. So I put this in my calculator, and I get 0 0.09, and so that rounds to 0 0.1, and so that's my decimal rounded to the nearest tenth. Now, as I mentioned just a second ago, when it says the probability of not getting a 5, that's talking about everything else except for a 5, so it's all the 1s, the 2s, the threes, the fours, and the sixes. So you could count up all the ones, twos, threes, fours, and sixes. Or it actually might be easier to just count the fives and subtract them from 54. So I count the fives and there's 10 of them. So the probability of getting a not five would be 44 out of 54 because 44 of those outcomes were not fives out of the 54 outcomes. And then getting a decimal for that is going to be 0.81. So we're going to say approximately equal to 0.8. And so that would be an 80% probability of getting anything else if I was to roll the dice another time. Okay, the probability of getting a 7. Now there are no 7s on a dice, so the theoretical and experimental probability on this is the same. There were no 7s on here. And if I was doing this with with the just theoretical probability, it would be 0 out of 6. It doesn't matter. It's all equal to 0 because that's an impossible event. So 0 represents something that is impossible, that can never happen. So one other just side note, if you get a probability and if you round it to the nearest place value and it comes out to round to 0, you wouldn't need to go more places because you do not want to say that it's the probability of something is zero unless it is literally impossible. Okay, number five, the probability of getting an even number. So what you need to do is look at all your outcomes here and find out how many even numbers you have. So all the twos, all the fours, and all the sixes. How many of those do you have? So pause the video, count them up, and do number five and six. Okay, when I counted, I got 24 numbers in that box that were even out of 54. So hopefully I counted right. If I didn't, you can write the correct answer and just tell me about it later. So that comes out to be 0 0.4 repeating. And so because I'm supposed to round that to the nearest tenth, it would be 0.4. If I was saying what the probability was, I think I would be more comfortable with saying 0.44, because 44% sounds a lot more accurate than 40%, so that's, but the direction say nearest tenth. Okay, and then the last one, the probability of not one. So what you should have done is count the ones, and I'm counting seven, and so 54 minus seven is 47. So 47 out of the 54 rolls were not ones, so that makes my probability of that happening again, of not getting a 1, to be, it says 0.87 is what I get, and so that would round to 0.9. So again, 87% compared to 90%. Um, nearest tenth, for simplicity, if I was doing for pure accuracy, I would definitely go more decimal places. But we have to follow the directions. Okay, the next one, it says find the theoretical probability. So we're just predicting what's going to happen if I do one roll of a number cube or dice. So what's the probability of getting an odd number? So back to our definition at the very beginning, 
um, right here, the number of favored or desirable outcomes. So what's my desired outcome? It's an odd number. So there's three odd numbers. There's one, there's a three, and there's a five. So there's three desirable outcomes. How many possible outcomes? And so that's one half. It doesn't say how to write my answer here, so we've got a reduced fraction. We've got a decimal, and we've got a percent. Um, I would prefer one of these two, probably not the percent unless there's a reason for it. Um, the fraction, if it's more accurate than rounding a decimal, then go with the fraction unless you're told otherwise. Okay, what's the probability that you roll this dice and you get a negative number? There are zero negative numbers on that dice, so zero out of six, which is zero, or zero percent. So that's an impossible um, event. The probability of getting an integer. Well, one, two, three, four, five, and six are all integers, so there's a six out of six probability of getting an integer. So no matter what you do, you're gonna get an integer, and so this is what we call a certain event. Okay, it is going to happen. And then number 10, a factor of six. And so what are the factors of six? One is a factor of six because one is a factor of everything. Two is a factor of six, three, and six. So out of the six outcomes, four of them are factors of six. So two thirds is the probability. I can round that, or I can write a decimal. Actually, I can write exactly equal to 0.6 repeating. I can round it to 0.67 which would be about 67%. So again, it just depends on how you're being told to write your answers. If a question like this is on your homework and it doesn't say, then that's fine. The next problem, it says you pick one ball from a jar, you replace it, and then you pick another. So you're getting this jar of balls and you're gonna pick one out, look at it, note the color, and then put it back and then you're gonna go in and get another ball. So each time you go and pick a ball, you have exactly the same jar that you're choosing from. So this is what we call an independent event because every time you pick a ball out of the jar, it doesn't matter what you got before, you have the same probability that you would have on your first try. So it's an independent event. It's also a compound event because you're doing two things. You're doing more than one event and you're finding the probability that they're both happening. So um, for 11, it says find the probability of getting a purple ball, put it back, and get a blue ball. So purple ball, put it back, get a blue ball. So the way you do this, if you go back and look at what we did at the beginning, right here, the probability of compound events, you take the probability of the first event times the probability of the second event. So we're going to take the probability of getting a purple. So since there's two purple balls, out of how many balls are in the jar. So five plus three is eight, plus six is 14, plus two more is 16. So there's 16 balls in the jar. And then you're gonna go back and you are gonna have 16 balls again because you put the purple one back. And what's the probability of getting blue? There are five blue. So you're gonna multiply these two together. So one option that you can do is you can reduce any fraction. So we could say one eighth times five sixteenths it does say to write as a simplified fraction. So for that, that would be a better idea. And then remember how you multiply fractions just across the top. And then eight times 16 is 128. And so this is your reduced fraction. I know it's reduced because I've already simplified all the factors that I can. So I don't need to worry about it not being reduced. Okay, for number 12, let's start all over again. And so what's the probability of getting a green ball? So green balls are six of them out of 16. And the probability of getting a yellow ball. So multiply by yellow, and that's going to be three out of 16. So again, I need to look and see if I can reduce anything. That will help with my fractions. Six and 16, two goes into both of them. And I can't simplify anything else. I'm going to multiply across the top, three times three and 16 times eight. And so that's the probability that I'll get a green ball and a yellow ball on my two tries. So it's not really likely, it's about 7% that that's gonna happen. The other 93% of the time, you're gonna get some other combination. 
Okay, pause the video and do 13 and 14, and then come back and make sure you got that right. Okay, the probability of getting a green would be 6 out of 16, and then the blue is 5 out of 16. And so again, I'm going to go through and simplify. And so I'm going to get 15 out of 128. And then the probability of getting a blue and a purple. And then simplifying. So I'm going to have 5 over 128. So of those four problems, the best chance I have would be to get a green and a blue. That would be the best chance of anything happening. Um, the least chance would be these two things right here happening. And so if you were going to, you know, bet on something, I would bet on getting a green and a blue. So that's how gambling works. Not that I'm encouraging you to gamble, but that's how it works. You're taking a chance based on theoretical probability that your desired outcome is going to happen. Okay, the last set of problems we're going to do is this one is going to be different. It says put all the balls back, so now you're starting with a whole new jar. You're going to pick one ball and then without replacing it, and that's important, the without replacing part makes this a dependent event. Because when you have the one ball and you have it in your hand and you go to get the second ball, now you don't have 16 balls in there anymore. And you have one less color in there as well. So now that changes this. It's still going to be a compound event, but it is going to be dependent. So we're going to find the same probabilities of the same events, but see what happens. So the probability of getting a purple, hold it in your hand, and then get a blue. So probability of getting a purple in a whole new jar is going to be 2 out of 16. And then when I go back to get a blue, there's still 5 blues in the jar, but there's only 15 balls in the jar. And so that changes. So if you look at that compared to with the um, previous one that we did for that situation right here, number 11, that was 2 out of 16 times 5 out of 16. This one's 5 out of 15. So that changes things. So again, just to make things simpler, you might want to reduce your fractions because then you won't have to at the end. But that chance is 1 out of 24. So do you have more of a likelihood to get purple and blue if you don't put the one back or if you do? So you compare the answer to number 15 to the number in answer 11 to do that because the decimals or the fractions are different decimals are an easier way to compare and that's one of the reasons why decimals are really good in probability because it's just easier to see um, which one is bigger and so if I compare these two as decimals I have a better chance if I don't put the first one back so if I was going to choose and I was going to like win money, if I got a purple and a blue, I'd say, okay, well, I'm not going to put the one back. Okay, number 16, the probability of getting a green in a new jar, and then do not put the green back, and then you go in to get a yellow, is going to be 3 out of 15. So reducing your fractions, 2 goes in there 3 times and 8 times, and then 1 fifth. So 3 eighths times 1 fifth is equal to 3 over 40. And so again, you can compare that one to what happened before when you um, did replace it. You have a lot better chance of this happening if you don't replace it. Um, that's not always the case, but in this particular situation, it looks like that is the case. And so the probability of green and blue Okay, hey, pause the video and make sure you can do number 18. So you do notice that just as before on the 11 through 13, um, the chance of 11 and 14 were the same. And you notice that this time the chance is the same with replacement or without replacement. That's not always the case. In this situation it is. And that's one thing about probability. It's just based on the situation. 
Okay, you're now ready to complete the assignment and um, feel free to write out your answers in different ways. Just circle the one. If there's um, something specified in the directions, just circle that one, but you're welcome to write it as a decimal and a fraction or a percent. Just make sure you have what's required. Also, it's good a lot of times to write out some possibilities and maybe to draw some pictures and so think about what's happening in the problem.